What's going on YouTube? Paul Paul Piper here and today we're going to discuss plug chewing tobacco. So yesterday's video uh, we discussed dry snuff tobacco and just an overview of it. Today we're going to talk about plug tobacco, plug chewing tobacco and uh, there's still a decent number of uh, brands out there of plug chewing tobacco, but it's not all that common. You'll see it in, you know, a few tobacco shops, but you don't see it at drug stores or um, grocery stores or anything like that. It's it's pretty rare. You can find it online at Northerner.com and a couple other uh, merchants, but. By and large, plug is is kind of going by the wayside, and I'm not going to do any reviews specifically of any particular brands. Um, like this one is Bloodhound, and this one is Days of Work, and this one is Cannonball, and uh, Cannonball. Just briefly tell you. This was uh, what my great-grandfather chewed. He worked uh, on the Erie Railroad um, as a plumber back when they had the old uh, steam engines. Um, he started out as a switchman and he got hired on, I think, in about 1910. And he worked for the Erie until he retired in 1953. And I never met him. He died in 1965, I believe. but. Uh, you know, my dad you know, tells me stories of uh, how he always chewed cannonball plug. And as you can see, plug is almost looks like a brownie. And it has like a light uh, wrapper. That wrapper is actually a composite leaf. It's a composite tobacco leaf. So you can either choose to chew it or remove it. I mean, um, the way they manufacture that, it actually is ground up, really fine um, leaf, and then they put an adhesive to it. So uh, either way you want to do it, I always just bite it off, and I bite the wrapper and chew on the wrapper. You're not swallowing it, so as long as you just chew it and spit it like you're supposed to, you won't have any problem. Um, you know, if you take a knife, it's got to be really sharp and, you know, because this is compressed tobacco leaf and they use, you know, things like molasses or honey or whatever else to give it the moisture, give it the flavor, but then also to, uh, uh, keep it together. And... The size of the leaves, it's kind of similar to loose leaf. So loose leaf chewing tobacco that you get in the pouches, that's pretty consistent with what the size of the leaf that's used in a plug is. Again, it's just because it's been compressed. They're taking all of those leaves and they're compressing them and uh, putting the wrapper and there's your plug. Um, now, it will expand a little bit in your mouth. So if you take a, if you take a, you know, bite out of it, that's going to expand a little bit. Um, now, as far as a, I guess a serving size, a standard one, you know, if you bit off everything above my finger here, that's going to be a, a pretty good size. Uh, chew for you. You know, you don't want to go in here and take half of it because that's going to be really large. It'd be like taking, you know, half a bag or half a pouch of loose leaf. So keep that in mind as you're trying to figure out how much to, um, to take. But now as far as the history of plug tobacco, this was 
the way uh, chewing tobacco was uh, marketed and distributed in the early days of this country. Loose leaf chewing tobacco didn't come around until a little bit later in the 19th century. And the way loose leaf came, came about was uh, cigar shops, so cigars have been popular for ever. Cigar shops, when they would make their cut on the wrappers and, and that sort of thing for the tobacco, they'd have leftovers. And they said, we don't want to throw this stuff out. So they marketed it as cigar clippings. And that was uh, the birth of loose leaf chewing tobacco. And cigar clippings that were initially sold were just that. It was just uh, unflavored, plain tobacco leaves that were left over from you know the scraps of making cigars and a lot of brands that you'll see they've gone but a lot of them you know you might see them in antique shops or online or that sort of thing they actually called themselves you know scraps or you know like gym scrap or whatever um, and that's that was the beginning of loose leaf chewing tobacco again that was the ninth, late 19th century but before that this is how you purchased chewing tobacco. It was in a plug. A lot of times the plugs might be larger. And I actually have an example of a box here. So this is you know, a nice antique plug tobacco box. And it was actually boot jack plug tobacco. Costliest because it's the best. And as you can see, the size in there, you know, that's probably 14 inches or so long, and your plug would come in there. Now, you're not going to carry that huge uh, plug with you and, and that sort of thing. You're going to need to have it cut down into more manageable uh, serving sizes. And to do that, what they would do is general stores where you would buy your plug tobacco would have one of these. They'd have a tobacco cutter and it would be out on the uh, merchant's uh, cabinet and or counter and he would take the plug again it's very long and he would put it in here this blade this is a little, not the best condition one. I got it cheap so I picked it up just as a decorative piece and something that I'm interested in. So you would put that plug here and then you would cut it up. So you put it down and then that blade would come down and make a fairly clean cut into a certain serving size and then you'd give that to your customer and they'd go about their way. Now, these are always uh, iron pieces. They're pretty heavy um, and what was interesting is you can find all kind of different brands of these different manufacturers and a lot of them correspond to a particular brand of plug tobacco so the tobacco company would distribute the tobacco to the merchant but then they'd also give them one of their branded tobacco cutters so if you walked in and you saw a Lorillard, Lorillard uh, made beech nut and a bunch of other tobacco products in the uh, late 1800s and the 1900s. You know, you might be compelled to buy one of their Lorillard uh, chewing tobacco products. And there was a whole bunch of other different brands, um, especially back then. There was hundreds, thousands of tobacco companies little shops in every little town and I encourage you to research your town's history and and see what connection it had to you know the tobacco industry um, because it was really something to to think about I mean you had all these different capitalists and all these different 
you know, companies, entrepreneurs springing up everywhere and making their own cigars, making their own loose leaf chewing tobacco and plugs and different things. And uh, it's not that way anymore. Today, everything's pretty much, you know, big business and multinational corporations in bed with government. And, uh, you know, it's kind of sad how it developed, but it is what it is, I guess. But that's a tobacco cutter. And it tells you a little bit about how it was packaged. Um, a lot of times if you watch the old westerns and stuff, you know, Clint Eastwood and things, like Outlaw Josie Wales, he goes into uh, a general store as they're heading down to uh, escape, you know, from Missouri. And uh, he goes in and orders a bunch of plug and from a general store. That's how it was sold. He's not chewing Red Man. Red Man didn't come around until 1904. Uh, Beach Nut was 1897. So, uh, you know, it was it was plug. That's what you chewed. And you know, for nothing else, nostalgia, what have you. If you like to chew, you like to dip, pick up a plug, try it. That way you can say you've tried it. And, uh, and see what you think. Um, you know, they're, I like loose leaf chewing tobacco a lot. And I think plugs are good. I mean, they're pretty much the same. You're going to get that molasses flavor. Um, probably less raisin flavor with a plug. More molasses. Um, the consistency is a little bit different because it's compressed, but it does expand. Um, and as far as leaf composition, you know, like Bloodhound is 59% U.S. tobacco, 41% foreign tobacco. Um, Days Work, Days of Work is uh, uh, at least 45% domestic grown tobacco. And Cannonball, my great grandfather's, uh, now, I can guarantee that. Probably 30 years ago, 20 years ago, this would be 100%. You know, that's the federal government subsidizing farmers not in America not to grow tobacco. And it's a travesty that that has been done. But anyway, Cannonball is only 15% U.S. tobacco. So, you know, from that standpoint, and I've had all three before. Um, they're all pretty similar. I'll do reviews on each of them. But anyway, hope you enjoyed this video, folks. You know, scroll down, hit like, subscribe to my channel, um, and, you know, leave some comments. Let me know if you've ever had uh, plug chewing tobacco. If you remember, you know, going to any shops, any country stores, and seeing the tobacco cutters out on the counter. Um, but until next time, folks. It's been Paul Paul Piper. Take care.